السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. My name is Sadiq Abdul Malik. Why? What I'm intending to do right now is to try to draw on the truth that people of opposite viewpoints can agree upon. I'm going to use the testimony of the scholars of Christianity that will make a case by their answers for the absolute truth of Al-Islam among the scholars of Christianity, distinguished professors, chairmen of departments, men who have achieved the highest scholastical accolades and who have written various books and who are well respected throughout the United States and in fact throughout the world. Men who are quite active uh, in the endeavors that they pursue, they pursue, and are men who are very, uh, how should I put it, universally distinguished. Um, the Quran says, in dealing with this, it says in Surah 41, verse 53, we shall soon show, show them our signs in the universe and inside themselves until it will become clear to them that it is the truth, is it not sufficient as regards to your Lord that he is a witness over all things? This is Surah 41 verse 53. In Surah 27 verse 76 it states, Verily the Quran explains to the children of Israel most of the matters in which they disagree. I'm going to put that into great use right now that divine truth of the Holy Quran and I will now contact this professor very distinguished extremely uh, uh, distinguished professor who has gone throughout the world in his role as a professor a lecturer and a person who enga engages in debate as a, a person involved in Christian apologetics and I will call him now we've had a conversation before it didn't start out too good at first and then after a while, it leveled off to something very good and very respectful. Um, apologetics, the nature of apologetics, you know, when you're talking about religion, uh, at some point could get very heated. And he, at one point, uh, for some reason or another, uh, became kind of agitated. Um, but anyway, how are you, sir? You're doing okay. Um, this is a person who has spoken, spoke to you one time before. Um, my, uh, I hope you remember my name is Malik and I hope uh, what we talked about in the conversation that we had wasn't at all uh, offensive to you or made you angry. Uh, that was not my intent. I just wanted to seek uh, to learn by getting answers from a person like yourself who is very well accomplished in, you know, as far as scholarship goes. And so I in no way, shape or, or form meant to in any way to be antagonistic towards you or to be a cause of uh, anger for you. I'm happy that you, I guess you got the uh, the message that I left. I forgot what message I left uh, that day that we talked, and so I guess it it had to do with calling you to Islam, and I respect that. Both religions are two religions. They call people to uh, mercenary in nature. And they call people to uh, to follow them. Uh, our as Muslims, our proof and our basis of religion is that we establish the God. Um, upon whom all have established as God and hum, upon whom all have submitted their will to. And we see Jesus Christ as being a great example of one who submitted his will to God. And my questions to you were based in establishing whether Jesus Christ showed in Old Testament verses, for instance, that he showed any autonomy or equality or any lack of accountability to God where he acted completely as an equal to God. And your response to me was what it was. 
Um, I don't think that you had made that case. I don't think no Christian has ever made it because it doesn't exist within the Old Testament, uh, where the Messiah acts as an individual or as a person equal to God without accountability, who has the power to abrogate and or change law, and who acts completely autonomous without any accountability to God. The Old Testament, Old Testament record, the Old Testament record begins to speak that he is. But, but I have one question for you, and I have to go. Because I make this call just as, as an apart, you know, to kind of apologize and to hopefully, you know, to hopefully make, continue this dialogue. And so the question I have, if you can answer it, is this: Can you give me any information? Uh, yes, sir. So I have the final word. Sure. All right. I'll do that. <laughs> you know, my wife says that I, I don't do that with anybody, but I'll do that with you. Uh, I give you my word. And and here it is. Here's the question. Um, is there any place that you can get me uh, a secular information? Because I don't see this within the Bible. Any information that states uh, outside of the Bible, biblical record, where there is a recorded historical uh, document and or statement that states that the firstborn of Israel, as stated in the Bible, the killing of the firstborn of Israel by Herod the Great, uh, that this was documented either by Roman sources by Greek sources, by Persian sources, or by Jewish sources, that that actually in fact happened. And secondly, is there, if you can give to me, any proof of any secular writing outside of the Bible that states that on the day that Jesus Christ was crucified, that they in fact witnessed a eclipse of the sun, an earthquake, the dead coming out of the ground, and the, and the sick being miraculously cured. I'm asking, for any secular, uh, but on the second one, what I'm saying on the second one is that you know about earthquakes and, uh, and eclipses of the sun. These are things that have a certain science to them where they are felt and identified and where they are shared by a group of people throughout a range of, of, of distance. You know, an earthquake and a uh, uh, eclipse of the sun. Now, both these things are considered back in the old days, in the ancient days, as acts of God, and many of them were recorded, in fact, Way before Christianity, the Chinese were recording earthquakes. So I'm asking if you can give me any secular, secular information testifying to those two things. Uh, all that is okay. <laughs> and somebody walking by my door. Yeah, I know you're a person, you're busy, you got to be busy. I want to talk to Robert Spencer. I'll talk to Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer's uh, latest book, which is a farce. First of all, he doesn't understand that in Islam, from the very beginning, the action of writing down information and the action of memorization, not to mention the fact that to say that oh, 50 years after Muhammad, in fact, during the life, right after the life of Muhammad, already there was an author citing hadith 
immediately after him, and I will get you that information. As far as Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's existence, I will. Okay, I will get you the exact. I, I will get you the exact. I will call you back. I will leave you. I will leave you the information on your cell, on your machine, so that you can look it up with the verifiable sources, so that you can see that already hadiths were being written immediately after the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in that case, if we're going to say something like that, you know for a fact that you have no information on Jesus Christ from the ages of six months to 27 years old. And I mean, you know, it's, uh, Robert Spencer seems to have lost his mind that he's making people go to this uh, kind of thinking. But the thing what I'm asking you is, please, could you answer the question? Because you can't answer a question with a question. I'm asking you, um, is there any secular sources that relate to an event which is shared by a space of people and time and uh, 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 experience, which is an earthquake and a, a eclipse of the sun, that if anyone wrote it simultaneously on that day that they experienced an eclipse of the sun and an earthquake, which again has a wide range of experience. An earthquake can only be measured after it is three point something on the Richter scale. For one to call something an earthquake means that it was felt, and if it was felt, it had to be felt over a long range of miles by a, long, by a great amount of people of diverging uh, places. Uh, as far as the, the eclipse, the eclipse has a penumbra and a numbra, which means that it also has a, a, a mileage by which people experience it. So what I'm asking you is, is there anyone, anyone, anywhere who wrote that they experienced an earthquake and an eclipse of the sun simultaneously at the same time? Or any Roman soldier that said, or any Jew that said he saw one of his family members rising from the dead and going into Jerusalem. I think that these things should be very clear. The second point that I put about uh, Herod the Great killing the firstborn of Israel, uh, that should also be something that is very well written, sir, and you know, because, for instance, follow Josephus, hated Herod. He hated him to the point where he told you that he died by his penis falling off from a, from a disease of the skin that his penis actually fell off. And uh, Philo, uh, Philo Josephus spared no, uh, no pennies, as it were, in describing his hatred for, for, for Herod. But, yet, but Philo, yet the most heinous thing that a person can do, which is to kill a child, was done in mass and yet there is no mention. So I'm asking maybe, follow Josephus made a mistake. Maybe that in Roman sources, because uh, Herod had to report back to the Romans and everything he did was under Roman control and had to be done with the consent of Rome, that in Rome there would have been someone who had stated within the Roman sources, because you know, the Romans wrote down everything. The Romans <laughs> wrote down how much corn they planted, how much they got back. I mean, they wrote everything. They were one of the greatest chroniclers. So I'm asking if anyone has any written record of the firstborn of Israel being killed by Herod, especially knowing that Herod by that time was already dead. Can you please answer the question? I'm sorry, I tried to hurry what I was saying because it's very important. You, you know, I asked you a question and you went on Muhammad. We can discuss Muhammad anytime you want, but what I, what I called you is for, for an answer to those two questions, if you can help me. Alec, you are not a very conversant person. You do not listen. You do not allow people to talk. I am not interested in a diatribe. I just dealt with two weeks of dealing with all the Boston Marathon melee, all induced by Islamic theology and fun fundamental views, just like yours. And I'm not interested in that type of God. I'm not interested in that li type of lifestyle. I'm not interested in that type of conversation or argument. I look to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I see him as God himself. He has made that very clear to me. I see that in the scriptures. I see that historically, uh, scientifically, archaeologically. And so I call you back to Jesus Christ, to the truth, to the one who has peace. And may peace be with you. Goodbye. Hello? 
What you see there, this is a man by the name of Janosek. This is Janosek. I'm going to give you a I'm going to give you a his bio. Professor Janosek. Dr. Janosek's interest includes academic in academics ranges from science apologetics, he taught biology for over 20 years, to apologist, to Islam. Uh, 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 it, let me read it again. Dr. Janice said interest in academics range from science apologetics, he taught biology for 20 years, to apologetics to Islam. MA in Muslim studies, PhD on John of Damascus, and his writings on Islam to church historical, uh, historical theology. As the director of Islamic studies, Dr. Janicek's desire to develop materials and provide instruction that will encourage students to learn more about Islam so that they can minister more effectively to Muslims. As the as director of online education program, Dr. Janicek seeks to provide a quality online program that will extend to unique, his unique teachings at CS, CES to the rest of the world. In over 20 years of teaching university students, Dr. Janicek's desires have been to challenge the students to think critically of themselves and to the material that they are studying so that they might show themselves approved of the Lord. In other words, if his students are not more excited about God and his creation after they have taken his classes, then he feels that he has failed. Whether he is teaching them biology or theology, he wants to challenge them to think God's thoughts in their pursuit of his truth. He also wants them to understand that the subject matter has accurately and proficiently as they can, as they can, as that means to understand the subject matter, that they will be able to assess the world around them and make decisions, that they will be able to assess the world, uh, assess the world around them. Therefore, in his own teachings, he seeks to, through his research, uh, accurate in his summations and God honoring in his words, in addition, since he is known as the tech teacher, he seeks to utilize all 21st century technology in his teachings so that the students are ready and able to minister in technology loaded world. They are in today. Education all over the place. Um, he's written books, articles. I mean, he's a wide range, academic experience. Uh, um, associate Professor of Southern Evangelical Seminary, Director of Online Education, Director of Islamic Studies, Instructional Designer for Online Programs, Interim Director of Online Development, Faculty Technology Specialist, um, Director of Educational Technology, Teacher of Ben Lippin School, Director of Academic Developmental Center, Teacher Norfolk Christian Schools, English Teacher, uh, conference papers by the truckload. This is a professor that had absolutely no answers. You saw how I was. He was not answering the question. He began to try to attack Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You cannot answer a question with a question. He made no point. In other words, he's saying we do not have that information, but you do not have this about Muhammad, which is an incredible, incredible lie too long to go into. We have a body. We have a history. We have a family lineage that still survive today. But we have nothing of that when it concerns Jesus Christ. So again, he could not answer any questions. And the first time I talked to him, it went the same way. He could not defend. Now he attacks Islam about being violent, about being a religion of violence. And he cites what happened in Boston, not knowing that the greatest violence ever committed on the face of the earth has been committed by Western Christian so-called civilization that number one, invented anti-Semitism. Number two, invented terrorism. The very first second the Christians got on a ship and left Europe and traveled the world seeking for new lands. They committed terrorism from that very second on. From before that, the Greeks were committing uh, terrorism. The Romans were committing terrorism. From ad infinitum, ad into Rome, into the church, the advent of the church into Rome, and the church taking hold in Christianity in Rome when it came the Holy Roman uh, Empire, Christian Empire. From that very second, the church itself 
took charge in the name of Jesus Christ to commit atrocities throughout the world, extinguishing native and indigenous peoples and extinguishing them, calling them pagans and heathens and savages. This is the history. But this is where these type of people, and I'm going to call them back again. Yes, uh, Professor Janicek, um, I, I really can't explain the way you, the way you are, are reacting. Hello? Okay. You know, you attack Islam. You, I, I look at your Bible, you say you're a scholar on Islam. Do you, and you attack Islam, you answer my question with an attack on Islam. You call Muslims as being violent, a religion of violence. Surely, sir, if you compare your book to our book, uh, it, is, it is not even close. And if you look at the history, I come from a people. I happen to be Puerto Rican from, from uh, part of me is Puerto Rico. My people on my mother's side, the Indians from the Caribbean who are the Arawak, the Taino, and the Caribe Indians are extinct. They were put into extinction by Christopher Columbus and the Christians that came from Europe that summarily executed them and made them not to exist. And no, not one of them exists. The only place where their culture exists is in a, in a, in a place called... Uh, in Honduras, with a group of people called Garifuna, who maintain the language of the Arawak Indians as they themselves, sir, they themselves were runaway slaves who were black in Honduras called Garifuna, who mingled with those Indians running away from Christian oppression and murder, who then maintained their language, part of their language, while the people that it belonged to, the Arawaks and the Caribe and the Taino Indians are extinct. I dare tell you, sir, that there has been no greater killer on the face of this planet than Western Christian so-called civilization, and you know it. If you were to compare Islam to Christianity historically and take out all the sources historically, you would see that it's not even close. And in fact, it is the United, it is Western Christian so-called civilization that invented the concept of an industrial military elite where money was actually made in droves and riches actually acquired through the sale and the exportations on, of weapons on the face of the earth. And indeed, the, the, the technology of weaponry has been advanced by Christian, Western Christian so-called civilization. Our own civilization here in the United States is the most violent civilization that this planet has ever known. We kill for the hell of it. While in Islam, in those countries that are going through what they're going through, they're going through a revolution. They're going through a political crisis, which happened in the United States of America with the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, where social change had to come about through struggle. And then these nations came about. But we as Muslims don't kill for the hell of it as part of our everyday life just for the thrill of it and then cite the constitution as a right to giving us as as a as a vehicle by which we have the right to bear arms and lose the responsibility of why we kill we don't have that in islam and in fact we did not invent sir we did not invent sadomasochism you did if you can't make love to your wife peacefully how could you call anybody violent and i dare you to compare your book the Bible to the Quran and I will say this and I'll leave it with this if you find any verse in the Quran that commands the killing of women and children and babies I will leave Islam and become a Christian I give you my word so you will leave Islam if they um, if there is no injunction to kill women and children and look at all the fatwas that have been issued I said the Holy Quran, give me one verse. The factors were related just what you call uh, in, in, uh, in, in the United States of America, collateral damage. Okay, when you talk about in, in, in Islam and when we talk about 
this type of damage is called collateral damage, which the United States has identified to justify its drones in killing children, women, and babies while killing insurgents at the same time. And you call it collateral damage. These are things that cannot be helped. In Islam, we dealt with that a long time ago. But the Prophet forbade the killing of women and children. He only spoke that if they are in a place where, for instance, it's night, and by the actions of battle, a child is killed, then this cannot be helped. But he taught the Muslims never to do that. Muslims don't even, the sunnah of the Prophet when it comes to war was so, if you can say war is beautiful, which it isn't. But the manner in which Muslims fought was so honorable that it caused their enemies to become Muslim. We cannot say that about, about Christianity. And what I ask is that if you find one verse within the Quran that says to kill women and children like the Bible does, in the book of 1 Samuel, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the book of Joshua, in the book of 1 Kings that continues ad infinitum to say, and kill the suckling. The suckling means babies that are drawing milk from their mothers, the Bible commands to kill them by the command of God. Then I will become a Christian. That's my statement. Yeah, but you brought that up. I didn't. You, you talked about Boston. I didn't bring. I want to stay above that. This is not what we were talking because what happens is, sir, and I want to. Res I respect you because I know the knowledge you have. What? Yeah, but it's because you're making statements. You said you don't want to do that, but you were the one that brought the thing up about Boston. And what you're doing is that if we as a people, I'm talking as an American, if we do not learn and understand the consequences, that the things we do have ramifications, and that if we do something to some people that we should expect that those things to be done back, if we don't look for the true reasons why, then we will be stuck where we are, believing that we have the divine right to do whatever to anybody else, and then to proclaim them savages or terrorists when they react. We did that already with the American Indians. When, we, when this land was taken from the Indians and they sought to defend themselves by scalping whoever, they were called savages. And we can't afford to do that any longer. World peace means that we as people have to look at the actions of each other, whether Muslims or Christian or Jew. We have to be accountable. And we have to take, take that accountability and say, what could it be that we're doing? Have you ever studied the history? I know you've studied the history of the Middle East as it relates to colonialism. I know you've studied what happened during the, the, uh, the Cold War, how the Muslim countries during the Cold War were used as pawns, and how that continued the history of Italy as it relates to that area. It's never ending. It doesn't stop in 1948, the taking of the land of, from, Palis, uh, from, from the Palestinians, however you want to characterize that. But it's been a long history, and you didn't hear about any actions about Muslims in any way that you could characterize as terrorists until after 1947, 1948. You oh, see? Come on, my legs. Okay, what before that? Have you read The Life of Muhammad by Ibn Yisak, the first biography of Muhammad? Have you read his book? Precisely. Have you read all the accounts of Muhammad and all the Precisely, books? and I could tell you precisely. No, no, again, again, when you talk, you, you're saying these things, when you talk about isolated incidents in the United States of America, you see my dear sir, when you're a leader, you have to make decisions that sometimes, you know, this is... Well, listen to me. No, again, killing up... Okay, well, let me, well, let me tell this. These, these, were, these were things. Banu Kureza. Banu Kureza. Do you know who Banu Kureza was, sir? Yeah, it was a tribe of Jews that were no more because Muhammad... Okay. No, 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 to say that they would know more, sir, is again a misstatement by you. You see, again, what you're using is to, are you, and you're a teacher of these things? Do you understand, if you ever read the, the Quran, Surah 5, verse 45, Surah 5, verse 42, in the Holy Quran, it gave the Jews autonomy, autonomy to rule themselves under their own rabbis. Everything that the prophet did to try to incorporate them, giving them autonomy to practice their own religion and to be judged by their own rabbis, 
was for not they sought to constantly within the framework of al-Madinah to destroy the Prophet Muhammad and Islam. They then incorporated themselves with the hypocrites. They made a, 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 an alliance with the hypocrites to again destroy Islam. And this is, again, you can look at this in certain instances in the seed of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you look at a man by the name of Finhas, when you look at a man by the name of Qais ibn Shais, who was another man who tried to stir, he was a Jew, and you could find this information how he tried to cause trouble by making the tribes of Al-Madinah, Al-Aws, and Al-Khazraj to fight again. They were, used to be at war a lot. When they received Islam, they had peace. This man, his name was Khais ibn Shais, he was a Jew, was with a young man, I'll tell you the story very quickly, he was with a young man who was part of... Okay, so then, okay, so this was the whole framework. Now, in the United States of America, the government of the United States of America sought to eradicate problems within the state. For instance, during McCarthy era, where they looked at the at the. Uh, at okay, so, all right then. Okay then. So you know, I'm just saying, if, if we can learn from each other, when we make. Uh, Uh, yeah, learning from history, really so sir. All I'm going to say, is Harry S. Truman a great president to you? Harry S. Truman. Well, these are the two questions I gave you. Could you please answer the two questions? It will testify. Where do you have the information about uh, those miracles happening? And number two, where do you have the information about Herod the Great killing the firstborn of Israel? If you're going to be stuck on those things, then you are lost and you're not going to find any answers. You've got to look at Jesus Christ, not... Men. Okay, then where does it say in the Old Testament that God has ordained that he will kill himself for the sins of men? Where God, not a servant... Not a Messiah, where God Himself has ordained that He would take up the, the, the mantle for dying for the sins of men. Could you give me the chapter and verse? Isaiah. Isaiah 53 again, sir. The Isaiah 53 does not say that God, God is the one who Isaiah perceived was punishing the servant, and it was God who was putting these things as a clear distinction between God and the servant. I ask you, where did it state within the Old Testament that God will take upon himself to kill himself for the sins of men? Not a servant, not a Messiah, but that he himself will establish that he will die for the sins of men. Could you give me chapter and verse? I don't have to. It doesn't matter. It's not there. If it is, if it is there, it doesn't matter. It's what Jesus showed and how we verified who he was, what he did. That's what's important. You're not going to have so then wherefore, then, then wherefore the final question, where does it state that Jesus, where does it state within the Old Testament that Messiah will have the right to uh, judge, uh, to resurrect the dead, to give the dead heaven or hell, and to abrogate law? Can you give me a chapter first? Because that would mean that the Messiah is acting as God, independent as God, and that he has the power to resurrect the dead and to judge them to allocate heaven and hell. Where does it state in the Old Testament that Messiah will have the ability to do that? That's not what I asked you. I asked you that if Jesus Christ made the statement, it is written that the Christ shall suffer and die and rise on the third day. He made a statement again about the book of Malachi chapter 4, 5, 6, meaning that Jesus referred to the Old Testament in order to justify who and what he is. You as a Christian use 600 verses within the Old Testament to testify to Jesus being Messiah. So you use it as a proof text. So therefore I'm asking you to provide the proof that the Christian definition of Messiah exists within the Old Testament. I asked you, where does the state within the Old Testament that Messiah will have the, the ability to resurrect the dead and to judge them and give them heaven and hell and or to abrogate law. He is God. He can do what he wants. And just because you cannot find something written in the Old Testament does not mean that Jesus saying it in the New Testament and, and uh, acting upon it and fulfilling what he says that he said, I will uh, I, I will um, be taken before the men, in three days I will rise from the dead. He raised himself, the Father raised him, and the Holy Spirit was involved as well. And that's what's important. You go back and you try to say, well, it's not, this is not there and that's not there. If that's going to be your religion and that's going to be your critique of Christianity, I'm sorry for you, but 
but you're not going to find the truth that way. But you have no, I'm establishing what you self-claim as a Christian. That the foundations, that there's textual harmony between the Old and New Testament. That they're in fact textual progression. I'm not looking for certain uh, statements here and there. You can always find, I mean, I could find thousands and thousands of things, or come up with thousands of things against the Quran, against Muhammad. I'm just going to let history, you know, deal with that. And that is great. What, what I'm asking you, somewhere within, I don't ask for, listen, I'm not going to be unfair and ask you for a direct very statement. Fair. You're being very unfair. I, I'm asking you for an indirect statement yeah. or a suggestion within the Old Testament. Let's put it this way. Just a suggestion, just where it's suggested that the Messiah will able, be able to resurrect the dead and allot them heaven or hell. Just a suggestion. Do you have one? Not a direct statement. Just a suggestion, or any suggestion, just a suggestion, not direct, where it is stated that the Messiah will be able to act independently and autonomously of God, as God, without any accountability to God, where he will have the power to, to uh, adjudicate and or change or abrogate law. I'm not asking for a direct statement. I'm asking for a suggestion anywhere within the Old Testament. My suggestion is this. Look at Christ and what he did. Because that's where the answer is. He said that I and the Father are one. Oh, uh, okay. The only decision. If you're going to reject that, then you've rejected Christianity and you're not going to understand how the Old Testament fits together. And I can't okay, here's the final question. Final question. In the book of Matthew, in the book of Matthew, I believe in Christ, sir. I believe that he's the Messiah. I believe that he will come back. And that he will establish the kingdom of the God who sent and created him. And that in fact your Bible makes the same statement in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Where Jesus Christ is subjected to God. That he in fact in the Bible the statement is that he will be subjected to God. Where he says, oh my Lord, those that you gave me, I kept them in thy name. In fact, call them in front of me again that I may proclaim that those that you gave me, I kept them in thy name. Jesus being subjected to the God who sent and created him. This is the statement of truth. It is you who have made a man a God. Jesus didn't, in fact, the church fathers, let me just, uh, just, let me go to this. Book of Matthew, does the devil suggest in book of Matthew chapter 4 in any safe form that Jesus Christ is God and his encounter with, with Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 4? Does he make any statement that makes complete divinity for Jesus Christ within that chapter? And does Jesus respond to him as divinity, as God? Do you have any uh, opinion on that? This has to happen in order for this to be true. You can't do that. That's not scholarly. Then let's look at it. Did Mary make the, the, the claim then that Jesus Christ is God, the one to be worshipped as God and to be worshipped and prayed to? You know, you have two testimonies. The devil who knew Jesus before he was a seed in the womb of Mary. Then you have Mary who carried him in his womb. May God's peace and blessings be upon the both of them. Neither one of these two statements, one before Jesus came to the earth, nor the one while he's in the earth by his mother, proclaim him God. And when you look at Jesus and his life, the life of the prophet and Messiah was to establish a relationship that was real and spiritual with the God who sent him and created him. And when he comes back, he will establish the kingdom of God, not his kingdom, where all men will worship the one God. This is the book of Ezekiel where all men will worship the one God, where peace will be established on earth. Why? Because there will be no more deputation, good sir, about religion and who is God. We will all know who God is. The third thing is that the, the people shall follow God's commandments and laws. The, and the fourth thing, and the ten criteria, the fourth meaning that, all the, that the temple in Jerusalem will be built, dedicated to the worship of the absolute and one and only God. These are the four of the ten criteria. I'm going to go. I'll get dinner. And I, I will say this. I worship the one and true God. And Jesus is that one true God. A true Wait. God. Okay. Okay? And that's where we're going to have to differ. I'm not okay. I wish you would have made the stake. And the thing is that you teach Islam. You see, the reason I called you, the only reason I called you, is because gentlemen like yourselves who claim high scholarship have taken upon themselves to push prejudice 
and to push a feeling and a hatred of Islam that is not just. I just ask you that if you study Muhammad and you put him and compare him to anyone that you call a great leader, for instance, if you compare him to Harry S. Truman, who Harry S. Truman, we say, was a great leader who stopped the World War II by doing what he did. And in reality, in what Harry S. Truman did was kill 65,000 people within five minutes. But you consider him a great leader because he stopped the war. But that is called an obligation of leadership. That no leader can, has, it's a lonely job to be a leader. You have everybody to think of. And sometimes decisions have to be made that are distasteful, that are done for the greater good. Um, and this is what Mohammed said. Jesus didn't have to do that. Jesus didn't have the responsibility of leadership. He was never what you would call a leader of a people, a nation, a founder. He didn't have, he was a preacher who tried to reestablish a relationship with God. His kingdom was not a, a kingdom of, of this earth as it were to, to, to be a king and a ruler. It was to establish a relationship with the God who created him. But Muhammad did that plus founded a nation in the midst of the most horrible antagonism that can be faced within and without the hypocrites, the Jews, the Christians, the Romans, the Persians, within the state of Islam, he had to face pressures. And when you look at all the wars, supposedly while Muhammad was alive, there were 18. Total casualties, 1,800. Total casualties. So, you know, when we look at that, let us be fair. If you want to criticize Muhammad for the, you can do that, why? Because we have over close to a million books of Sunnah and Sirah that you can refer to. And anyone can be picked apart. You know, when they have, because with Muhammad, my dear sir, Muhammad didn't have a, uh, a clause for top secret. Top secret, uh, vital to the, the, uh, to the welfare of the state. Muhammad, by his own order, commanded that everything he does and say be written. Have you ever met a leader anywhere in the organized world where everything they did, they left up for scrutiny? Muhammad did. So this is because he felt sure of his prophethood. He said, you can, I'm a simple man, I can't read or write, but you know what? I'm going to open myself up to scrutiny. I'm going to open myself up to criticism on into the millennia because my, the people with me will write about me. Imagine, has any leader done that? We have top secret. We have the CIA and the FBI that hold the secrets of the state. Do we know everything that our leaders do know? Because it's called part of the security of the United States of America or the security of the greater good, the collective. But Muhammad didn't have that. He opened everything up for scrutiny. Truly, had there been a greater man that this earth has ever seen, it couldn't have been greater than Muhammad. And this is a, a deal, and the last thing I would like to say, Please do not listen to Robert Spencer. I'm looking for Robert Spencer. He knows me and I've been looking to debate him for the longest and he's been running for me for a while. Robert Spencer makes a statement. You see, sir, today the atmosphere is that if you want to get rich, you want to make a lot of money, write a book against Islam. You'll become rich. Robert Spencer understands this. He has no scruples. His latest book, Did Muhammad Exist? Wow. 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 You talk about spitting in a hurricane. And he makes this book. Do you're a scholar. Read. Ask yourself the relevant question about this man, Muhammad. If he was not a prophet, could all these things have been done? The way he acted. Had he not existed with the Quraysh, you know them well, the Quraysh, could they have given up their lavish, do dominative lifestyle? Given it up for a dream, for a lie, and given it up for nothing? Or was this a fact that they faced the greatest uh, uh, danger to the, in the history of their society, which caused events to change volcanically? Did they make Muhammad up? That eventually made them lose their dominion and their power and their position? You know, it's unbelievable. And I, I don't seek to argue. I just, I just seek to open channels. We begin, we've got to begin to talk truthfully. I'm a former Christian. I don't hate Christianity. Though I know what Christians have done. I know the history. And I, again, I tell you, 
If you were to compare Western Christian so-called civilization with Islam as far as violence and war, it's not even close about people being killed. You know the facts. It's not even close. In, in, this is the last one. In 1649, in, in uh, Ireland, in 1649 in Ireland, Cromwell. Yes, sir. Okay, I understand. Sir, may God bless. I enjoy. Listen. Okay? Oh, boy. Don't get You haven't made the point. If he can't be Messiah, if he doesn't qualify as Messiah, how can you make the case for him being God when he doesn't even qualify as Messiah under the Christian definition? This is the point that I've been trying to make with you. How could you claim him to be God if he doesn't even fit the Christian definition of Messiah, which is a pathway to try to make the claim that Jesus Christ is God? If that doesn't exist, how can you even sit here and try to make the attempt? Hello. Hopefully, God willing, you will see the truth. Not one answer, only attack. Making a claim out of theology and belief rather than what is in the book. The Holy Quran says, Am lakum sultanum mubin, fatu bi kitabikum in kuntum sadikin. If you make a claim, then call your person of authority, your sultan, your teacher, your scholar, your professor. If you make a claim, call them and have them verify what you claim, says the Quran. It then says, Fatubi kitabikum in kuntum sadikin. If you bring your scholar, your teacher, your professor, then also bring your book, your scripture and prove the claims that you make through that which you call a divinely revealed book. I challenged him on those two points. He, being a scholar, being a professor, being a teacher of tremendous accolades and a person who is well written, written many books and articles and is seen as a leader within apologetics, and then I also implored him to utilize his Bible and to reference his Bible for the claims that he makes. On both occasions, he could not answer. You are witnesses, you are, you are witnesses in this video yourselves. You are witnesses yourselves. You heard, you saw, making claims about, for instance, the violence in Islam, what happened in Boston. And then he said that he doesn't want to do that type of thing when I told him that it was he who brought it up. My Christian brothers and sisters, with your own eyes you see, the Christian definition of Messiah within the Old Testament whom Jesus Christ refers to over and over and over again as a proof text, upon whom Christians today utilize as a proof text to say that Jesus spent over 600 prophecies of that Old Testament, that this professor, scholar, writer, debater could not cite one proof text or come up with one answer, not one verse, not one text. But not only that, my beloved brothers and sisters, when he made the point that you can't ask for a certain statement directly in the Bible, that, that, that would be unfair. I said, yes, sir, it is. Then give me just a suggestion, something that suggests the point, something that even slightly implies it. He still could not answer. The Holy Quran says again, 
We will soon, in Surah 41, verse 53, we will soon show them our signs in the universe and inside themselves until it becomes quite clear to them that it is the truth. Is it not sufficient as regards to your Lord that he is a witness over all things? SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And here is my appeal. Think, look, see, and you will find God as I did. Jesus was created and understood God. Moses, the same. Isaac, the same. Ishmael, the same. Jonah, the same. The Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, understood in that brotherhood of prophets that came with the very same message that God is absolutely one and the only one worthy of worship. For nothing that is created can be equal to God and or God. And in fact, that God cannot create another God equal to Him. That may be the one thing that God cannot do. Because God will always be creator over the other God, no matter how powerful He is. He will still be creator while the other God is created. Nothing can be equal to God. Let me give you my concept of Trinity. Trinity was nothing more than the Christians of the early church trying to establish a chain of command. General, Colonel, Major. This is what it was. None of the early church fathers believed that Jesus Christ was God. Not a one of them. They established for the early church a chain of command. And that has a long history that I can't go into. But the thing is this. In the rules of men, there is a chain of command within the army and the armed forces. It exists with men. Um, so a, a colonel can be elevated to a general. And if these two generals occupy the same space or the same uh, t, uh, theater of operations or the same base and they're both equal, Still one general will take command over the other general, even though they're equal. What determines that? That the other general has seniority over his opposing general, over, over his counterpart, the other general on that base. Let me say it again. That if two generals are together, the general with seniority becomes commander with the other general being second in command, though they are equal in rank. So in reality, there is no equality in that system either. Unless both generals uh, 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 were at the same time. They graduated at the same time. Then it becomes a question of expertise and field of knowledge as to who takes over command of a certain base. So again, there will be a commander. But that is in the realm of men. In the spiritual realm, there is no such thing as an elevation or promotion to the position of God. Nothing. You cannot be promoted to become God. Says the Quran. Why do you worship? That which you create with your own hands, when I created you, and that which you use to worship. How can you make this God, how can you make this God because it saves you from having your feet hit the dirty ground? Man made it. A man made this. How could you then worship this because it stops you from hurting your feet on the barren ground? How can you worship this? You made it. By the same token, and you created this, by the way, by the same token, how can you elect a person to be God? How can you choose a person to be God? How can you promote a person to be God? As I said throughout that video, and I speak with that scholar, Never once did he prove that Jesus Christ was God, making theological statements without proof. And I told him, if you cannot prove that Jesus, uh, that the Christian concept of Messiah exists within the Old Testament, 
How can you even begin to make a case that Jesus Christ is divine? If the Christian definition of, old, of Messiah in the Old Testament does not exist, which they use as a link to try to give divinity to Jesus, it doesn't exist. The concept of Christian Messiah within the Old Testament does not exist. And I just hit it on very uh, uh, lightly. I didn't go into detail. I didn't go into detail. It doesn't exist. So if that linchpin that Christians use to make Jesus Christ God, meaning that Jesus being Messiah is also divine and God, if that does not exist within the Old Testament, how can you make say that Jesus Christ is God when you never claim to be God? His disciples never claimed to be God, that he was God. His own mother didn't claim that he was God. His own brothers didn't claim that he was God. In fact, they had a problem proclaiming him a prophet, though Mary had him as a, as a baby. Mary had him as a virgin. Had Jesus. She had problems even proclaiming him a prophet. Luke, in the book of Luke, Simon and Anna, who had received revelation from God, contacted through the Holy Spirit, and told of the birth of the Messiah, never claimed that Jesus Christ was God, and they were contacted by the Holy Spirit himself. Supposedly, if you're a Christian. Where is the proof? Never stated it. And Anna was called a prophetess with the power of discernment and called a prophetess and lived her life never proclaiming that Jesus Christ was God. On top of that, the devil in his confrontation, which I asked him again, and he could not answer. I told him about the book of Matthew. In the confrontation between Jesus Christ and the devil, did the devil make any claims to the divinity of Jesus Christ? And did Jesus act in divinely toward the devil. Did Jesus act as God in his dealings with the devil? He could not answer the question. You know why? Because it doesn't exist. The devil never thought that Jesus Christ was God. He said, worship me and I shall give you all you see. Worship me. And Jesus never countered his, his, uh, uh, the devil with a statement of divinity. But rather he countered it with a statement of faith to the God who sent him, created him. SubhanAllah, the book of Matthew chapter 4, in actuality, is a death knell for those, for Christianity. For those who dare to think, know that God is merciful, that he loves, that the job of the prophets, all of them, was to establish a relationship with a God who forgives, who is merciful and who is loving, and who is given to those who seek him with sincerity, with their mistakes, with their errors, and with their perfections, that they have access to God in the kingdom of heaven. This was the job of the messengers. At some point we shall talk about Greek philosophy and the Alexandrian Jews and the impact they had on the creation of this abomination, which I must be true, because it, abomination, I call it abomination, an abomination it is because it separates a human being from a relationship with God that gives them the kingdom of heaven and instead relegates them by the actions of their own tongue to punishment in hell. And that's why I call it an abomination. And that's why I call people to Islam to the truth. Submission to the will of God. That that is the mantra of all the prophets. And that was the message of all the prophets, to submit to God and establish a relationship with Him. And that this is salvation guaranteed. So having said that, uh, let me say it's kind of hot in here. Uh, and let me say again, this is the second time I have this conversation with this professor who I read to you. Uh, his accomplishments, and uh, I will continue to read his accomplishments, his articles, John of Damascus, Influence of Kalam, The Fate of Culture, in The Fate of Culture, uh, the, real, the Real Story Behind the Massacre of Banu Qureza, which he has absolutely no idea of, which again he did not want to deal with when I told him the background and gave him information from the Quran. Uh, can a Christian believe in evolution? These are the things he done. Uh, reviews, uh, book review, Christology and Dialogue with Muslims, uh, book review, a deadly misunderstanding of a congressman, quest to bridge the Muslim-Christian divide by Mark, and he uh, critiqued these books. 
He's a very accomplished professor in the art of delusion. His knowledge of Islam is based on hatred, not on truth. And none of the points that I dealt with, you are witnesses there, none of the points that I dealt with, he could deal, that I dealt with, I mean, he could answer. Not a one. You heard for yourself. Um, this is the type of conversations, not in this way, with this professor, because 98% of my conversations with professors are beautiful. And they go along the same way. No answers. You cannot defend the lie. You can only delude yourself into believing that it is possible to defend the lie. And that's what these Christian scholars are about. You know, Pharaoh understood when he confronted Moses that the God of Moses was real, that the God of Moses was true, that the God of Moses was the only God to be worshipped, the power over all his dominion. But yet Pharaoh's biggest problem was recognizing God was that he could not give up his position on this earth. He was Pharaoh. He was prayed to. He was worshipped. He was thought of as a God. People would bow when he walked by. They would not dare look upon him when he walked by. Imagine what that does to the ego. So even though he knew he was not God, because he knew it, he got sick, uh, he went to the bathroom, and he made mistakes, and he did not know the future, um, even though he knew he was not God, and that the God of Moses was God, he could not leave his earthly position. And he died separated from God. In hellfire. The pastor of a scholar, Christian scholar, but I have not been able to do so. So I'm calling Christian ministries to see. So that they themselves can answer Professor Janicek. He said, look to the life of Jesus. What? They themselves will answer. Yes, hello. How are you, sir? Okay. Oh, great. It's so hard to get in touch with someone. Um, I just took a shot in calling your college, and I'm so very happy that you picked up the phone. Okay. Okay, sir. Are you a New Testament professor? <laughs> okay, jack of all trades. Yes. Okay, great then. So I just want to ask a question, and please forgive me if the question sounds kind of ignorant, uh, but it's something I've been pondering as I've been reading the Bible, and I'm hoping that you can help me. And the question is this. So please forgive me if it sounds ignorant. Can you direct me to any verse, uh, now that I have a Bible in front of me, any verse that I can go to uh, that bespeaks in the New Testament, that Jesus Christ or the Messiah will act independently or autonomously from God, you know, without any accountability to God as God, with the power to abrogate or change law. Can you give me any no, verse that no I? Verse in the Bible with that. Not in the New Testament either. The only time of separation between God and Jesus was when he was on the cross. That's it. Can you explain that to me, please? I'm sorry, I didn't understand well, that. When Jesus was on the cross, he became sin for man uh, from the time of Adam to the last Adam. And uh, when he did that, God could not look upon him. That's the reason he cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm -hmm. And that's the only time that he's ever been without God. Okay, so that's the only time that he's ever been without God. So then, therefore, is the position, that, that's why I was asking, um, as we know that the Messiah is God, so is, it, is that right or wrong? Or? He said, I and my Father are one. Okay, so therefore. Uh, so, they are separate enmities. Okay, separate enmities, but they are one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay. One. Okay, one. So the, is there anywhere then, so there. Noah then being one, and Jesus Christ said, you know, all authority is given unto me. As I see the Father do, I do. What I do, I do not do of myself. So Jesus Christ then has a litany of saying that he, oh, 
was taught, is there any then, in no verse that you could tell me there where he asks, acts independently of God, uh, autonomous from God, without any accountability to God, and where he can abrogate or change law on his own? Okay, great. Time he would pray, he would pray to the Heavenly Father, and okay. he taught his disciples to do the same. So uh, when they, they question him, he, he he tells them, I and my Father are one. You see, you want to see, uh, see God look upon me, and, you know, that's it. But as far as changing laws or anything like that, no, he did not do it. Or acting independently from God without accountability. No. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you so very much. Dr. Okay. Professor from Bethany Bible College in Alabama. I didn't get his name, but he's from Bethany Bible College and Theological Seminary in Alabama. That's testimony number one to answer Janostek. Okay? Messiah does not mean God. Christian definition of Messiah does not exist meaning that Messiah and God are one, that Messiah is in fact God. It doesn't exist. That's so, so, very easy, made very easy by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he expresses that salvation, in his communication and instruction to his prophets, which then relay that to us. Truly a merciful God. And all he requires is that you believe and the requirement of belief is not for his benefit but for ours a win-win win situation subhanallah the mercy of Allah's panel time all the questions that I asked this professor I wish I think there were about four to six of them in total of which none he answered, which I applied to the Old Testament, could also been, have, have been applied to the New Testament. And in that context, they would have not been able to have been answered either. He said, look to the life of Jesus and what he did, because he could not answer the question from the Old Testament. So he said, look to the life of Jesus. Well, the life of Jesus bespoke the opposite of what he believes. The life of Jesus bespoke servitude and submission to God, accountability to God, seeking God, dependency upon God, understanding that his position as Messiah was an allocated and given position by the Creator, not one that was innate with him, but one rather that was given to him with all the accompanying tools that he would need in order to accomplish his mission. All completely accountable and in a state of submission and dependency upon God. So either way, Old and New Testament, I kind of felt sorry for him. I really did, especially when he mentioned and he said, uh, I am the Father of One. If you notice in the video, I shrugged and said, oh, I couldn't believe that that would come from a scholar. So anyway, having said that, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me leave you with a question to ponder. If God intended himself, God Almighty, the creator of existence intended to kill himself for the sins of men, then where did he make a provision within the laws of sacrifice for that possibility? Where did he make an, a stipulation to meet that possibility? Where did he put within the law a part of the law that can be interpreted to meet the possibility of God killing himself for the sins of men? Remember, sacrifice requires the shedding of blood. And that through the blood, the giving up of life. 
as the Bible states, I believe in the book of, uh, of Leviticus chapter 17, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The sacrifice is a giving up of life, the shedding of blood. God does not give up his immortality, nor can he shed blood. And in order for the sacrifice to be legit under God's law, he, God, must die and give up his immortality. So then where within the law does God make a provision or a stipulation to deal with that possibility? Where? I call you to Islam. May God guide your hearts. May you access and allow you to access the easy mercy and forgiveness and salvation that God offers us as a universal and shared message that he instructed and imparted in every single one of his prophets. That's all I could do, appeal to your common sense and appeal to that natural disposition that you have in you to recognize that God is one and hopefully wake that up in you. That disposition is called Islam. I pray that God makes you grab it and have a handhold to God's mercy, love and forgiveness. Assalamu alaikum.